as we work our way through this graphite 101. The main theme is that not all graphite is created equal, which pretty much applies to most industrial minerals. That what you see isn't always what you get. Uh, that first illustration is some vein graphite from um, Sri Lanka. So my outline is going to be to kick off with what are industrial minerals and then get uh, just as a sort of background and then we'll get down to something about graphite, the different types of graphite, uses, markets, exploration, and then a little brief thing at the end about mining and processing. So now industrial mineral definitions that traditionally defined as minerals and rocks mined and processed for the value of their non-metallurgical properties. Um, and they've also been defined as non-metallic, non-fuel minerals. Now look, these definitions don't always hold. For example, coal and anthracite do get used as industrial minerals. So they'd be fuel minerals effectively, but not being used for fuel in that case. And industrial minerals may be incorporated in the final product or consumed in the manufacturing process. And they may be natural or synthetic. Natural examples include calcium carbonate, sand, you know, construction aggregate, all sorts of things like that that surround us. Limestone, and then of course graphite, which is the topic of this talk, so I've highlighted that in red. And then there can also be synthetic industrial minerals, for example, calcium carbonate that gets used in the paper industry as tailor-made for specific applications. And then we have synthetic graphite as well. And what are they used for? Are they used for hundreds of everyday items around us? I've highlighted in red the graphite. Um, and we can see that they may be incorporated into the product, for example, graphite anodes in a battery or graphite added to brake linings, uh, all the minerals that go into things like glass and ceramics, paint and plastic and paper are actually incorporated in the final product. You know, a lot of copy paper has a lot of calcium carbonate. Um, on the other hand, some industrial minerals are consumed and then discarded during production. And where they may be discarded could be when they're used for filtration or purification purposes, such as clay used to purify edible oil like sunflower oil, or to filter, filter things like wine and beer and fruit juice. So they get used and consumed and then discarded, very rarely recycled uh, in, in those cases. Uh, some recycling does happen with cement and concrete and glasses, as you know. And then graphite, uh, I've included there for metal casting where it may be used in refractories. And I'd like to just show you some photo examples. They could be used in the product. The picture on the left is catheter. And that's the industrial mineral is the actual product. And then they may be used as in the right, um, where you can see the sand that's made out of uh, silica sand and coal dust and uh, bentonite, which is made into the molds, and then they can cast things like um, disc brakes and disc brake calipers. So in that case, the industrial mineral doesn't actually make it into the final product. In a brief history, there's a whole laundry list of um, applications there, and uh, over a long period of time that humans have been around, starting with stone tools, to me, are a type of industrial mineral from the Stone Age, flint, for example, and then going through a clay used in um, amphora, and then a whole plethora of different applications as the, in more recent times, including graphite for pencils, graphite for refractories, and I'll show you a refractory picture in a minute, and then in, in graphite um, for lithium ion batteries. So there's a long history of the use of rocks and minerals um, as effectively industrial minerals. So let's have a look at graphite specifically. What is it? It's made of carbon. It's very soft, it's got a hardness of one to two. We know it's really slippery if you touch it. It rubs off on the fingers. It exhibits both metallic and non-metallic properties. The metallic properties include thermal and electrical conductivity, whereas the non-metallic properties include chemical inertness, 
and hard thermal resistance and lubricity. Natural graphite occurs in three forms, flake, amorphous, and vein, and I've got some illustrations of that in a minute. And these three types of graphite find different market applications. And we're gonna probably focus on the flake because that's the biggest market. And there's just a list of um, what graphite gets used for um, mainly. The sort of traditional uses include refractory metallurgy and the ones to the right. Batteries is where the market is growing. And there's a picture on the left of um, brake linings where the graphite's incorporated in the product and actually used as the product, which is one of the reasons um, wheels go black with the dust coming off. Graphite crucibles, um, where the graphite is used to make a crucible, which you can pour metal into, but it, the graphite then gets used up. So it doesn't go into the final product. And then, of course, pencil, lead, and lubricants. Things that are around us every day. I don't have a picture of a battery, but we all know what they look like. And the three types I mentioned earlier on the left is flake graphite. Um, you can see the silvery flakes on the, in that piece of rock. That's from an underground mine in Europe. The middle illustration is uh, metamorphosed coal, which is known as uh, amorphous graphite. And the one on the right is some vein graphite with quartz from Sri Lanka. And I'd like to highlight two of the sort of, um, shall I say, trending areas of graphite consumption, which is flake graphite, um, where I've got some application examples. If we look at that photo on the left, that's a spherical graphite plant. And what they do is take very fine graphite, less than about 150 microns, and put it into those um, machines, which uh, roll the graphite into little potato shaped things. That's that middle illustration. And they get used in battery anodes. And then on the right-hand side, you can incorporate chemicals into the graphite, which when, when you heat the graphite, it then expands. So those are two of these sort of up and coming uses for flake graphite. And if we cut those little potatoes of graphite uh, in half, that's what it looks like. You can see that the graphite is rolled up into little balls and they're 10 to 15 microns in diameter. And then expandable graphite, which is um, being treated with a chemical uh, and then exfoliated uh, using heat. And that vermicular looking material can then be rolled into a graphite foil, which may find applications in things like laptop computers as a way they'll put a sheet of that material to dissipate heat. Okay. Where is it mined? And we'll go through quickly the main countries of production, something about mineral resources, prices, and specifications. I hope you can see the slide, it's rather small, but these are the latest USGS uh, figures. They've estimated about a million tons a year of natural graphite, so you can see it's a small market compared to things that we're more familiar with in Australia, like iron ore that goes in the hundreds of millions of tons. And China is the world leader with roughly 80%, 70 to 80% of natural graphite production, followed by Brazil, Mozambique's a growing producer, and then various other countries, including Norway with an underground graphite mine, and Australia with no production that I'm aware of. And those main producing areas are shown there with the red stars, China, being the leading one, Mozambique and the east coast of Africa, and Brazil, and then over in the Americas, there's nothing produced in the USA. Canada does produce a bit. There's Mexico, and then coming over into the European area, Turkey. Ukraine has been producing um, black graphite as well. And then Norway right up in the Arctic Circle where there's an underground mine. So that's the distribution of the main graphite producing areas. Now, graphite might be mined open cost, and typically grades are between 5 and 15% graphite content. And the picture on the left is taken from northeastern China, sort of up towards the 
Russian North Korea border, which is the main producing area in China. And that's partially weathered graphite schist and granite in an open pit. And on the right is deeply weathered saprolite in Madagascar. So you can mine hard rock or so called free dig clay rich material. And then going underground is one would expect the grade goes up a lot. And the two mines that are currently in production, of which the biggest one is Norway, it's now owned by an Australian company. Uh, the mine is called Skarland, and the grades are sort of 20 to 30 percent graphite. There was an underground mine in Zimbabwe, but that closed two or three years ago. Uh, prices, um, as with all industrial minerals, markets are really key, and the price varies tremendously according to the specification, the type of graphite, and the application. So if we take flake graphite, it can vary tremendously between roughly 500 and 2,000. These are just very rough sort of US dollar figures uh, per metric ton once you've extracted the flakes out of the rock. The amorphous graphite uh, is the cheapest variety, often not the purest. And then vein graphite, which can be very high purity from Sri Lanka, that's the only producer in the world. And there we're looking at prices around 2,000 or more. And they can produce stuff by hand sorting up to 99% purity. So a big range of prices and very dependent on markets and where it was the start of mineralization. And going on from prices, uh, specifications. Now, the, there's two tables there. The first one is an example of refractory products and graphite specifications. If we look down the left-hand column, you'll see there that it says um, that there are different types of refractory products, including crucibles and, and uh, refractory bricks, for example. The middle column shows the flag size, and then the purity is on the right-hand side. And you can see there's a, quite a tremendous range of both sizes and purity. So it's not always the case of, you know, you've got to have something ultra pure and huge, big flakes to work. It, really depends on the end user. And generally these specifications are set between the supplier and the end user, as are the prices which um, are not publicly um, available as a general rule. In countries like China, where there's a sort of more central government uh, control, they've actually got national standards. Uh, and there again, I've just given some examples there of the percentage of carbon, and, and some sort of idea on their category as to whether they're high purity or low purity. But I'd say as a general rule, the specs are set between the user and the supplier. Okay, graphite exploration. Uh, as we're all aware with the growth of um, EVs and all this uh, green energy business, Graphite exploration's really been on the up since about 2012, the last 10 years. But let's have a quick look at how much graphite's been discovered in that time. Something about the geology, uh, sort of favorable geological environments. A brief look at how geophysics may be used, the drilling techniques, something about petrography and mineralogy, and then the type of lab tests required. So if we look at the last 10 years, uh, these are figures that I've compiled. Um, nothing much has changed in the last two years or so since I put this together. But uh, explorations added more than 5 billion tons of resources to the global graphite uh, resource base at grades of between approximately 2 and 25% graphite. And if we look at that graph on the left, you can see the graphite uh, content up the left-hand side goes from 0 to 30, and I've ranked them in terms of graphite grade. So a lot of the, uh, the majority of the graphite deposits that have been discovered are probably between about 5 and 15% graphite. And I've left that ranking the same, but just put on there the mineral resources. 
And you can see that the one on the right, there's a tiny little red blip. That's actually the one that's the highest grade, but it's a tiny tonnage. So there's no real correlation between grade and tons and what people have discovered. The total amount of 5 billion tons I've calculated from publicly available data contains in excess of 460 million tons of different sizes of flake graphite, which is sufficient for a long time. So let's have a look at the geology. And I'm going to focus on flake graphite, seeing as that is the one that most of us are, going to, are likely to be involved with as uh, geologists and exploration and mining engineers and such like. So flat graphite occurs in rocks known as graphite schist or gneiss typically, formed by metamorphism of original carbon-rich sedimentary rocks. As a rule of thumb, graphite flake size increases with increasing metamorphic temperature. And the flake size varies with in-deposit and between deposits. And there may be more than one flag size population within a deposit. And I'll show you some of these under the microscope. And what sort of geology is perspective? Look, for all you geologists out there, this is a really basic <laughs> bit of geology that I've used for often uh, at sort of investor conferences. So we start with the protolith, which may be that carbon rich sediment, which then gets metamorphosed. And the rule of thumb is that the graphite flake size increases with metamorphic grade. And if we just look at low grade and high grade in that block there on the left, temperatures sort of 300 for the low grade metamorphism, up to 700 or more for the high grade. I've said they're volatile, a lot of water floating around in the low grade material, and we'll see that in the mineralogy. Then the rock type would tend to be slate or schist for the low grade and varying from uh, to nice or granulite for the higher grade and then the grain size from fine to coarse. And I've just mentioned the metamorphic facies varying from green schist around for the light to granulite. And if we just look at some illustrations, we all know that slate, which is a low temperature metamorphism, is fine grain. You can't see the individual minerals. As a general rule, and then we go to granitic rocks, which are in the amphibolite to granulite grade, where we can actually see coarser grained individual minerals. And that's pretty much reflected in graphite deposits. I'd be very unlikely to look for a graphite deposit in a greenstone belt. You might find graphite, but it'd probably be low crystallinity and not easy to extract. And if we sum it up in this little graph here, I don't know if you can see the cursor when I move it around, but um, we'd really be looking at somewhere around there from amphibolite to granulite from roughly 600 to 800 degrees centigrade. And if we look at the minerals, which I've mentioned, the high water minerals, for example, green schist grade, there'd be mica or chlorite bearing. And then moving up through the amphibolite to granulite, minerals such as amphiboles and saliminite and then pyroxenes which have major implications for separating minerals uh, and uh, actually liberating graphite. Geophysics is commonly used for exploring for graphite or various types of graphite. This is an example publicly announced uh, from a graphite deposit in Mozambique, where they used v uh, airborne surveys to define conductive areas. Of course, the graphite, as I mentioned earlier, is an electrical conductor. So it can be defined by electromagnetic methods. And in this case, the scales on that map, I think are 200 meters of grid lines. That anomaly was defined and then drilled, uh, shown on the left. And then on the right, they did some fixed loop EM work to define the um, plates, the conductive plates, if you like. So that sort of technology would be used to find the deposit and then hopefully verify the shape of the deposit um, after drilling. And downhole uh, EM methods can be used as well. And drilling methods. RC percussion is, is commonly used, especially in an early phase, to see if there's any graphite there. 
and core drilling. They may be used in combination. Some people use almost either one or the other. And of the two, the core drilling is really the only one that's any, of any use for using for metallurgical testing. So it's highly recommended that core drilling is done because the percussion drilling smashes the rock up, reduces the graphite and size, and makes it very difficult to determine the, how easy it is to extract the graphite. We may also look at it um, under the microscope, um, polarizing microscope. We could use polished thin sections as shown on the right there, which could be the whole pore or could be uh, chips from an RC uh, sample. And the further stage in exploration would be to actually take samples and uh, crush them to the appropriate size and then use flotation to remove the graphite. That's a very important step in the whole thing of uh, actually getting to a mineral resource. Now, what do we use to check graphite quality? Uh, as a basic thing, the explorer would use, analyze total graphitic carbon and usually add, uh, sulfur as well. Um, so apart from that, irrespective of how much graphite there is in the rock, they'd have to extract the graphite and graphite would typically get tested for such things as moisture, bulk density, how pure the flakes are, Use XRD to look at the crystallinity. There's things like thermal stability. How does it put up with um, being treated with heat, for example, for refractories? Does it oxidize or does it stay stable? Might use microscopy, SEM, to look at the shape of the graphite. And then check for actual performance. Does it expand? Can it make a foil? Spherinization, can we actually make those little potato-shaped things out from the, from the flakes, and does it actually work in a nano? Um, John and I have both worked on bentonite projects, and he'd know that it's all very well known there's bentonite there and there's a certain cation exchange. How pure is it? But actually, can you use it for anything? And it's, a, it's the same with all of these industrial minerals. Can you actually use them for anything? Right, my favorite hobby horse. Not all flat graphite is created equal. Um, this is probably no news to anybody, but um, I think it's worth bearing in mind. So what I wanted to do was have a look at some stuff, thin sections under the microscope. And we're going to mention the grade, how much graphite there is in the rock, what effects weathering have, something about flax size distribution, and then a little bit about mineralogy. So what happens in uh, graphite deposits, in this specific case, flake graphite deposits are weathered. The, one on the, the photos on the left show unweathered graphite core. And you can see the difference between the unweathered or unoxidized, actually, which is the most important thing, compared with the right, which is highly oxidized. You can see the red-brown color. And if you just look at the graphite flakes on the left compared with the right, um, you can see that the graphite in the fresh rock is nice big flakes with nice clean silicate minerals on either side, uh, as well as pyrite. And you could imagine if you had to crush these rocks up, it would probably be fairly easy to liberate the different phases. Compared with weathered or if you like oxidized, where feldspars and saliminite and uh, aluminosilicate minerals go to clay, kaolin for uh, these Sulfides might form minerals like jarosite. There's many things that can happen. And what happens there is you end up sometimes with quite a complicated mess. And you can see that the split graphite flakes on the right, the clay actually, because it expands into leaves with the, like that, into the uh, graphite. And that needs to be taken account for when trying to liberate it. So weathering or oxidation is a major factor to start with. Now let's just consider two different deposits. Deposit number one on the left has 10 to 20% graphite contained in it. And on the one on the right, which I'll call deposit two, has five to 10%. But just look at the difference. Those scales are the same, 500 microns each. 
the graphite on the one on the left, they're tiny little flakes. There's some slightly bigger ones. In fact, there's really a bimodal population. And on the one on the right, there's millimeter-sized flakes. So don't be fooled by grade. It's really very important. This the, and often we found that the higher grade graphite deposits don't have the biggest flakes and uh, don't know the reason for that, but that seems to be what we've seen so far. Um, just like to show you some examples of nice clean graphite with nice granular gang minerals, that titanite, the amphibole and pyrite, which um, should be easy to liberate. So those are nice fresh rocks from underground mines. And then in the weathering environment, you can see the, the cloudy minerals are kaolinized, but still producing acceptable product. And these are from actual producing mines up in that northeastern part of China in Heilongjiang province. I've visited some of these. Um, so that gives you an idea of the sort of rock that you can get extract the graphite from. Although this isn't a game changer, it's important to notice here where there's a porphyroblast of uh, feldspar, that big clear area in the middle with lots of tiny enclosed uh, graphite flakes. So you might analyze this particular rock and for, let's say 10% graphite in the deposit, maybe a couple of percent tied up in these porphyroblasts and probably never going to actually extract them economically. So again, just a case of being aware of whatever you get in situ that may not represent what you get out of the rock after crushing and liberating the graphite. So we can have bimodal populations quite frequently in graph flat graphite deposits. And then I mentioned markers earlier. This is probably a sort of lower amphibolite grade one on the left. There's lots of marker and biotype brown stuff on the left. Uh, and the graphite's interleaved with that. And you can imagine they'd both be fairly difficult to liberate because they're both uh, lamella minerals. And then on, the one on the right, some, uh, just another example of some very tiny flakes that you'd have to crush down very fine to uh, crush the rock down to liberate those flakes. So mineralogy, I can't stress more, is really important. And I don't think there's any shortcuts. You can try all sorts of other methods that you think are easy, but there's nothing quite like looking at a whole lot of thin sections where you can see the actual rock in situ uh, and, and see the minerals relationships nice and clearly. So to sum that up about mineralogy, in situ flag size may not reflect the size of flags liberated during processing. Graphite-bearing rocks, as with all other rocks, may be overprinted by weathering or hydrothermal alteration effects. Um, you may have retrograde metamorphism uh, that's turned the feldspars and similar to kaolin. So even at great depth, you could still have kaolin uh, mineralization with its attendant split graphite effect. Uh, sulfide minerals may be oxidized, uh, as I mentioned. Secondary minerals such as calcite might occur and they could coat graphite flakes, making them difficult to liberate. And the basic summary of this is that not all gra graphite is created equal and variations in original carbon content, rock type, metamorphic history and weathering conditions can all affect graphite deposits to different extents. And one thing I, uh, you know, which I actually don't have a slide in, but markets, uh, I can't stress markets and pr proximity to markets and proximity to ports are also things that need to be taken into account with, with flag graphite or any industrial mineral, actually. Often the transport costs more than the mineral. Processing, how do we go from that crude brown ore, horrible looking stuff on the left, to shiny gray flakes. Those flakes, these are examples in China. Those flakes are probably the 80 mesh, plus 80 mesh, which is plus about 0.2 of a millimeter, which is considered a medium to coarse product. So from that to that, flake graphite is extra extracted by conventional means, crushing, 
milling, flotation, screening, and drying. So I've just got the rod or ball mill on the left. Uh, these are examples in China through a dewatering screw after the milling, and then feeding it through to flotation cells, and they may go through several cycles of flotation and regrinding in between flotation, and then drying in a rotary dryer at the end, after which they may be sieved to bag. And I think we need to remember here that extraction is likely to reduce and actually very likely will reduce the flake size. Uh, and some ores process easier than others and don't degrade significantly. So it sounds like I keep on repeating myself, but key conclusions. The variations of the original carbon content, the metamorphic history and the rock type and weathering condition all affect black graphite deposits. Bigger isn't always better. Resource tons and grade are not specifically a guide to the quality of the graphite deposit. Though, of course, grade generally helps. If you can find a nice high grade deposit with lots of flakes that are easy to get out and the right size, so much the better. What matters is the quality of graphite that can be liberated from the ore. Just in terms of grade, I, I would say there are some projects that have been touted around that have grades of like 2% graphite. And they say that there's, you know, they're nice big flakes, but that 2% graphite probably isn't going to work just uh, economically in terms of the amount of tailings you're going to generate and how much ore has to go through the mill. Once the, the flakes have been extracted, they have to be tested by that whole variety of different uh, test methods to see if they're actually going to work in the, um, in the markets. And the key geological takeaway is not all flake graphite deposits are created equal. And before I finish off, I'd say that the same in this battery minerals business, the spodumene producers have seen exactly the same thing. Because spodumene sometimes, you know, the lithium silicate mineral can be nice big uh, crystals, easy to liberate. Other times they can be intergrown very finely with quartz and impossible to get out. So as always, you really do need to understand the mineralogy before taking a decision as to whether a deposit, a graphite or industrial mineral deposit is actually, does have potential for economic extraction in the end. And the final thing I'd like to say is that clause 49 of the Jork code as it stands now is a really important uh, clause to address when reporting resources for industrial minerals. And that's me done and we're well ahead of time. <laughs>